Prussian incompatibility with the partisan. In Prussia, the leading military power of Germany, the uprising against Napoleon in early 1813 was fueled by a strong national feeling. The great moment passed quickly. However, it remains so essential in the history of partisan warfare that later we must focus on it. First, however, we must take note of an undisputed historical fact, namely that the Prussian army and the German army, led by Prussia from 1813 through the early part of World War II, furnished the classical example of a military organization that had repressed radically the idea of the partisan. The 30 years of German colonial domination in Africa from 1885 to 1915 were not important enough militarily to cause the extraordinary theoreticians of the Prussian general staff to take the problem seriously. The Austro-Hungarian army had to deal with partisan warfare in the Balkans and had a regulation for guerrilla warfare. By contrast, the Prussian-German army that marched into Russia on June 22, 1941 did not conceive of partisan warfare. Its campaign against Stalin began with the maxim, troops will fight the enemy, marauders will be handled by the police. The first special directives regarding fighting partisans came only in October 1941. In May 1944, scarcely one year before the end of the four-year war, the first complete regulation of the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces regarding partisan warfare was instituted. In the 19th century, the Prussian-German army became the most famous and exemplary military organization in the European world. But it owed this reputation exclusively to military victories over other regular European armies, in particular those of France and Austria. Only during the Franco-German War, 1870 and 71, in France did it encounter irregular warfare in the form of the franc tireurs who in Germany were called snipers and were handled relentlessly according to the laws of war, just as had been done by every regular army. The more severely a regular army is disciplined, the more correctly it distinguishes between military and civil, and only the enemy in uniform is considered to be an enemy. A regular army becomes more sensitive and more nervous when it encounters a non-uniformed civilian population on the other side of the struggle. Then the military responds with harsh reprisals, on-site inspections, hostage-taking, destruction of villages, and considers this to be the correct self-defense against treachery and perfidy. The more the regular, uniformed opponent is respected as an enemy and also in the most bloody struggles is not considered to be a criminal, the more ruthlessly the irregular fighter is treated as a criminal. That follows from the logic of classical European laws of war, which distinguish between military and civil, combatants and non-combatants, and which summon the rare moral courage not to declare the enemy to be a criminal. The German soldiers meant the franc tireurs in France in the autumn of 1870 and on September 2 achieved the great victory over Napoleon III's regular army near Sedan. Had the war been fought according to the rules of classical regular army warfare, one could expect that after such a victory the war would have ended and peace would have been declared. But instead, the vanquished French imperial government was dismissed. The new Republican government under Leon Gambetta proclaimed national resistance against the foreign invader, quote, all-out war, end quote. In ever greater haste, it continually conscripted new armies and threw new masses of badly trained soldiers onto the battlefield. In November 1870, it even had a military success in the Loire Valley. The situation of the German army was threatened and German foreign policy was endangered because a long war had not been foreseen. The French population was aroused with patriotic fervor and participated in the struggle against the Germans in various forms. The Germans arrested dignitaries and so-called notables as hostages, shot Frank Terroirs caught with guns in their hands, and pressured the population with all kinds of reprisals. That was the situation at the outset of more than half a century of struggle between international law jurists and public propaganda on both sides, for and against the Frank Terroirs. The controversies flared again in World War I as a Belgian-German Frank-Tureur struggle. In 
whole libraries have been written about the problem, and even in recent years, 1958 through 60, a panel of respected German and Belgian historians sought to clarify and resolve at least one controversial point in this complex problem of the Belgian Frank Terroir struggle of 1914. All this is illuminating for the problem of the partisan because it demonstrates that a normative regulation, if it is conceived to be a factual state of affairs, rather than just a collection of value judgments and general clauses, is juridically impossible. The traditional European bracketing of wars between states emerged after the 18th century from specific concepts of bracketed war and just enemy derived from the age of monarchy. These concepts were interrupted by the French Revolution, but the Congress of Vienna reaffirmed them and they became thereby much stronger. But they became legalized between states only when the belligerent states, both internally and externally, adhered to them in equal measure, i.e., when their domestic and foreign policy concepts of regularity and irregularity, legality and illegality, became substantively congruent or at least more or less homogenous in structure. Otherwise, instead of a demand for peace, war regulations between states were successful only in that they provided pretexts and slogans for reciprocal accusations. The simple truth is that this has been acknowledged gradually since World War I, Yet, the facade of traditional conceptual inventory still is very strong ideologically. For practical reasons, states have an interest in utilizing so-called classical concepts. Also, when, in other cases, they are ignored as obsolete and reactionary. Furthermore, since 1900, jurists of European international law deliberately have repressed any recognizable picture of a new reality. When this is taken for granted with respect to the distinction between traditional European state war and a democratic war of national liberation, then as Gambetta proclaimed in September 1870, the way is open for an improvised all-out war of national liberation. The 1907 Hog Convention, as did its collective forerunners in the 19th century, sought a compromise with respect to the Frank Terroirs. It demanded certain conditions whereby an improvised fighter with an improvised uniform would be recognized as a combatant in the sense of international law. Responsible leaders, firm and clear visible badges of rank, and above all, open display of weapons. The conceptual obscurity of the 1907 Hog Convention and the 1949 Geneva Conventions is a great and complicated problem. The partisan is still the one who refuses to carry weapons openly, who fights from ambush, and who uses the enemy's uniform, as well as true or false insignias and every type of civilian clothing as camouflage. Secrecy and darkness are his strongest weapons, which logically he cannot renounce without losing the space of irregularity, i.e., without ceasing to be a partisan. The military leadership of the regular Prussian army in no way was based on a lack of intelligence or on ignorance regarding the significance of guerrilla warfare. That one can see in an interesting book written by a typical Prussian general staff officer who knew the Frank Terroir's War of 1870 and 71. Kolmar Freiherr von der Goltz, the author, died in World War I as the leader of a Turkish army and was called Pasha Goltz. In all objectivity and with great precision, the young Prussian officer recognized the decisive failure of the Republican military campaign and observed, quote, Gambetta wanted to lead the great war and led it he did, but to his misfortune, because a small war, a guerrilla war, would have been much more dangerous for the German army in France at that time, end quote. Although also late, the Prussian German Supreme Command ultimately did comprehend partisan warfare. On May 6, 1944, the Supreme Command of the German Armed Forces issued the guidelines for fighting partisans. Thus, before its own end, the German ar army rightly recognized the partisan. In the meantime, the guidelines of May 1944 also have been recognized as an extraordinary regulation by one of Germany's enemies. <laughs>
After World War II, English Brigadier General Aubrey Dixon, together with Otto Albrun, published a significant book on the partisan, which reprinted extensively the German guiding principles as a typical example of the proper way to fight partisans. English General Sir Reginald F. S. Denning remarks in his foreword to the Dixon Hellbrun book that, in his view, mentioning the German partisan regulation of 1944 did not detract from the book, that the guidelines of the German army dealt with the struggle against Russian partisans. Two events at the German War's end, 1944-45, are not attributable to the German armed forces, but rather can be explained as antitheses to them, the German Volkssturm, National Storm, and the so-called Werewolf. The Volkssturm was called up by an edict on September 25th, 1944, as a territorial militia for national defense. During its operations, its members were considered to be soldiers in the sense of national defense regulations and as combatants in the sense of the 1907 Hague Convention. Their organization, outfitting, engagement, fighting spirit, and casualties are described in the recent publication of Major General Hans Kissel, who, since November 1944, was chief of the Volkssturm's operations staff. Kissel reports that in the West, the Volkssturm was considered by the Allies to be fighting troops, whereas in the East, the Russians treated it as a partisan organization and shot the prisoners. Different from this territorial militia, the werewolf was considered to be a partisan organization of youth. Dixon and, and Hale Brun report on the outcome, quote, Some few budding werewolves were caught by the Allies, and that ended the matter, end quote. The werewolf was characterized as an, quote, attempt to unleash a children's sniper war, end quote. In any case, we need not dwell any further on this. After World War I, the victors disbanded the German general staff and forbade its reestablishment in accord with Article 160 of the Versailles Treaty of June 28, 1919. It was consistent with the logic of history and international law that the World War II victors, above all the United States and the Soviet Union, which meanwhile had outlawed war, fought as a duel consistent with classical European international law, given their common victory over Germany, also outlawed and destroyed the Prussian state. Law number 46 of the Allied Control Commission of February 25, 1947 reads, The Prussian state, which for long has been the agency of militarism and reaction in Germany, has de facto ceased to exist. Guided by the idea of the maintenance of peace and security of nations, and with the wish to ensure further restoration of political life in Germany on a democratic basis, the Control Commission orders the following. Article 1. The Prussian state, with its government and all its administrative divisions, is dissolved. End quote. The Partisan as a Prussian Ideal in 1813, and the Turn to Theory. It was no Prussian soldier and no reform-minded Prussian officer of the Prussian general staff but rather a Prussian ministerial president, Otto von Bismarck, who, in 1866, to avoid being defeated, quote, wanted to take every weapon in hand to be able to unleash the national movement, not only in Germany, but also in Hungary and Bohemia, end quote. Against the Habsburg monarchy and Bonapartistic France, Bismarck was determined to get the Acheron moving, he was pleased to use the classical citation, Asheranta Movir, mobilize the netherworld. But, of course, he preferred to blame his internal political opponents. Asherontic plans were far from the minds of both the Prussian king, William I, and the chief of the Prussian general staff, Helmuth von Moltke. Some thinking must have appeared to them to be uncivil and also unprussian. The word Acherontic also would have been considered too strong for the German government and the general staff with respect to their weak attempts at revolting during World War I. Certainly in this connection, 
This also was the case with respect to Lenin's journey from Switzerland to Russia in 1917. But everything that the Germans thought and planned at that time about the organization of Lenin's journey has been surpassed and outdistanced so monstrously by historical developments that our thesis about Prussian incompatibility with partisan warfare thereby is refuted rather than supported. Nevertheless, once in its history, the Prussian soldier state had an Acherontic moment. That was in the winter and spring of 1812 and 13, when an elite group of general staff officers sought to unleash and control the forces of national enmity against Napoleon. The German war against Napoleon was no partisan war. One scarcely can tell to call it a national war, rather. As Ernst Forstoff rightly says, it was only, quote, a legend with political backdrops, end quote. It did not take long to marshal all the elemental forces in the firm framework of state order and to direct the struggle of the regular German army against the French army. Nevertheless, this short revolutionary moment was extraordinary significance for the theory of the partisan. At this point, one will immediately think of the famous masterwork of the science of war on war by the Prussian general von Clausewitz, and rightly so. But at this time, Clausewitz was still the younger friend of his teachers and masters, Scharnhorst and Nice Now. And his book was published only after his death, after 1832. However, there is another manifesto of enmity against Napoleon from the spring of 1813, and that is the most astounding document in the whole history of partisan warfare, the Prussian Landsturm. Army Reserve, or Local Militia Edict, of April 21st, 1813, i.e., the Prussian King's Edict published in all forms in the Prussian legal system. The prototype of the Spanish Reglamento de Partidas y Cuadrillas of December 28th, 1808, which became known as the Corso Terrestre in the well-known decree of April 17th, 1809, is unmistakable. But this one was not signed personally, by the monarch. It is astounding to see the name of a legitimate king on such a call to partisan warfare. This ten pages of Prussian legal compilation in 1813 certainly is one of the most unusual legal documents in world history. Every citizen, according to the Royal Prussian Edict of April 1813, is obligated to resist the invading enemy with weapons of every type. Axes, pitchforks, scythes, and hammers are in section 43, expressly recommended. Every Prussian is obligated to refuse to obey any enemy directive and to injure the enemy with all available means. Also, if the enemy attempts to restore public order, no one should obey, because in so doing, one would make the enemy's military operations easier. It is expressly stated that, quote, intemperate, unrestrained mobs, end quote, are less dangerous than the situation whereby the enemy is free to make use of his troops. Reprisals and terror are recommended to protect the partisans and to menace the enemy. In short, this document is a Magna Carta for partisan warfare. In three places, in the introduction and in section 8 and section 52, the Spanish and their guerrilla war are mentioned expressly as the, quote, model and example, and quote, to follow. The struggle is justified as self-defense, which, quote, sanctifies all means, end quote, section 7, including and unleashing of total disorder. As I have said, there was no German partisan war against Napoleon. The Landsturm Edict was changed three months later on July 17, 1813, and was cleansed of all partisan dangers and of every acherontic dynamic. Everything that followed was played out in the struggles of the regular army as the dynamic of the national impulse was played out with the regular troops. Thus, Napoleon could gloat that in the four years of French occupation of German soil, no German civilian took a shot at a French uniform. Then, wherein lies the special significance of this short-lived Prussian decree of 1813? It is the official document of a legitimation of partisans for national defense, and certainly a special legitimation, 
namely from a spirit and a philosophy that dominated the Prussian capital, Berlin. The Spanish guerrilla war against Napoleon, the Tyrolean rebellion of 1809, and the Russian partisan war of 1812 were elemental autochthonous movements of devout Catholic or Orthodox peoples whose religious traditions were not based on the philosophical spirit of revolutionary France and to this extent were underdeveloped. The Spaniards, in a furious letter to Napoleon's Governor General Louis Nicolas Davo in Hamburg, dated December 2, 1811, called Napoleon's troops a bunch of assassins, a collection of 300,000 badly led, superstitious monks which could not be compared with the diligent, hard-working, intelligent Germans. Berlin, in the years 1808 through 1813, was infused with a spirit that was thoroughly consistent with the philosophy of the French Enlightenment, so consistent that it was the equal of it, if not allowed to feel superior to it. Johann Gottlieb Fichte, a great philosopher, highly educated and brilliant military men like Scharnhorst, Nice now in Clausewitz, and a poet, mentioned earlier, Heinrich von Kleist, who died in November 1811, all recognized the enormous spiritual potential of the effective Prussian intelligentsia at that critical moment. The nationalism of this Berlin intellectual stratum was not just a matter of some simple or even illiterate people, but rather of the educated elite. In such an atmosphere, which united and aroused national feeling with philosophical education. The partisan was discovered philosophically, and his theory became historically possible. A theory of war also was part of this covenant, which is demonstrated by the letter that Clausewitz, as an unknown military man in 1809, wrote from Konigsberg to Fichte, quote, the author of an article on Machiavelli, end quote. With great respect, the Prussian officer informed the famous philosopher that Machiavelli's theory of war was too dependent on antiquity and that today one, quote, achieves much more through the continuous revival of individual forces than through aesthetic form, end quote. The new weapons and masses that Clausewitz had in mind express this principle completely. Ultimately, he said, the courage of the individual facing imminent battle is decisive, quote, especially in the best of all wars, when a people on its own soil is led to fight for freedom and independence, end quote. The young Clausewitz knew the partisan from the Prussian insurrection plans of 1808 through 1813 and 1810 through 1811. He had given lectures on guerrilla warfare at the General War College in Berlin and was one of the most important military experts on guerrilla warfare, not only in the technical sense, but also in the deployment of light, mobile troops. Guerrilla warfare became for him, as for other reformers of his circle, quote, above all, a political matter in the highest sense, meaning precisely of a revolutionary character. Acknowledgement of armed civilians, of insurrection, of revolutionary war, resistance and rebellion against the existing order, even when embodied in a foreign regime of occupation. This was a novelty for Prussia, something dangerous, which similarly fell outside the sphere of lawful states." End quote. With these words, Werner Halleg came to the core of the matter. Yet, he also added, quote, the revolutionary war against Napoleon, as the Prussian reformers imagined it, of course did not occur, end quote. It was a, quote, half-insurrectional war, end quote, as Friedrich Engels calls it. Nevertheless, the famous professional report of February 1812 remains significant with respect to the, quote, driving impulses, end quote, Hans Rothsfels, of the reformers. With the help of Neisnau and Hermann de Boyen, Clausewitz had conceived of it before he went to Russia. It is a, quote, document of sober analysis, both politically and in terms of the general staff, end quote, with reference to the experiences of the Spanish guerrilla war, and is content, quote, to return atrocity for atrocity, outrage for outrage, end quote. Here, the Prussian Lundstrom Edict of April 1813 is clearly recognizable. 
Clausewitz must have been very disappointed that everything he had hoped for from the insurrection had, quote, failed, end quote. He always had considered wars of national liberation and partisans, quote, party followers as he called them, to be essential parts of the, quote, exploding forces in war, end quote, and had worked them systematically into his theory of war, especially in Book 6 of On War, quote, Defense, end quote, and in the famous Chapter 6b of Book 8, quote, War is an Instrument of Politics, end quote, he also recognized the new, quote-unquote, power. Moreover, one finds astoundingly profound comments by him, such as the place regarding civil war and the vendi, that at times some few individual partisans were able to even, quote, use the name of an army, end quote. Yet he remained a reform-minded professional officer of a regular army of his time who could not let the seeds that we see here be developed to their ultimate consequence. As will become evident, that was possible to see only later, and it required an active professional revolutionary. Clausewitz still thought too much in classical categories when he, in the, quote, strange trinity of war, unquote, associated the people only with, quote, unquote, blind instincts of hatred and enmity the commander-in-chief and his army with, quote-unquote, courage and talent as free activities of the soul and the government as the purest rational handling of war as an instrument of politics. The moment in which the partisan first entered into a new decisive role as a new, formerly unrecognized figure of the world spirit was concentrated in this short-lived Prussian Landsturm Edict of April 1813. It was not the will of resistance of a valiant, bellicose people, but rather education and intelligence that opened this door to the partisan and gave him a legitimation based on philosophy. He could say that he had become philosophically accredited and socially presentable. Until then, that had not been the case. In the 17th century, he was a debased figure in a picaresque novel. In the 18th century, until the time of Maria Theresa and Friedrich the Great, he was a pandor and husser. But now, in Berlin, during the years 1808 through 13, he was discovered and respected, not only in a military technical sense, but also philosophically. At least for a moment, he acquired a historical rank and a spiritual consecration. That was an event that he could never forget. This is decisive. We have spoken of the theory of the partisan, now a political theory of the partisan, beyond a technical military classification, was possible in light of this successful accreditation in Berlin. The spark ignited by the Spanish against the North in 1808 found a theoretical form in Berlin that made it possible to capture the partisan in his glow and to negotiate his existence in other hands. To begin with, the traditional devoutness of people in Berlin at the time was as little threatened as was the political unity of the king and the people. It even appears to have been strengthened rather than endangered by the exorcism and glorification of the partisan. The Acheron that had been unleashed was returned immediately to the channels of state order. After the Wars of Independence, Hegel's philosophy was dominant in Prussia. It sought a systematic mediation of revolution and tradition. It could be considered to be conservative, and it was. But it also conserved the revolutionary sparks, and through its philosophy of history of the ongoing revolution, it provided the Jacobins with a dangerous ideological weapon, even more dangerous than Rousseau's philosophy. This historical philosophical weapon fell into the hands of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Yet... Both German revolutionaries were more thinkers than activists of revolutionary war. Only through a Russian revolutionary, through Lenin, did Marxism become a doctrine of world historical power, which it is today. From Clausewitz to Lenin Hans Schomerus, whom we have cited as an expert on the partisan, titles a section of his comments, which he made available to me in his manuscript, 
quote, from Empecinado to Bundesjai, end quote, that means from the partisan of the Spanish guerrilla war against Napoleon to the organizer of the Soviet cavalry, the leader of the Bolshevik War in 1920. Such a heading illuminates an interesting technical military line of development. However, for us, who have the theory of the partisan in view, this consideration directs attention too much to military technical questions of the tactics and strategy of mobile warfare. We must keep the development of the concept of the political in view, which precisely here takes a subversive turn. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the classical fixed concept of the political was based on the state of European international law and had bracketed war in classical international law, i.e., had made it purely state war. Since the onset of the 20th century, this state war, with its bracketing, has been destroyed and replaced by wars of revolutionary parties. For this reason, we use the following heading, quote from Clausewitz to Lenin, end quote. Obviously, in a sense, therein lies, in contrast to a technical military limitation, a certain opposite danger, i.e. that we will become lost in historical philosophical diversions and genealogies.